Uh, our final presentation of this morning uh, will be a panel discussion, and I would like to welcome back to the stage uh, John Podesta. Thanks. Well, let me uh, begin again by thanking the Secretary for his service. It's not often that you uh, get a Nobel Prize winner in the Cabinet, but I think the President was well served by, by this one, and, and uh, we'll miss him in Washington, but I know he's going to stay involved in, in the public policy end of, of these issues as well as the technology end. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dan Poneman, who's the Deputy Secretary of Energy and the Chief Operating Officer at the Department. Uh, Dan's one of the country's leading experts on arms control and nonproliferation. He served on the National Security uh, Council staff of uh, b uh, both uh, Republican and d Democratic administrations. I had the pleasure of serving with Dan uh, in, the, in the Clinton White House, and he served President Bush uh, before that. Uh, before returning to government, he was a principal in the Scowcroft Group. He's a Harvard Law School grad. Don't hold that against him. He's been a practicing attorney. Um, and joining, uh, joining Dan is uh, Bob Powers, the Chief Operating Officer of American Electric Power. Uh, Nick Akins, uh, the CEO, was supposed to be here, but he took ill, so Bob's uh, uh, filling in. We're glad to have him. He's one of our country's leader, leading uh, utility uh, experts. Uh, and of course, American Elect Electric Power is one of our country's leading utilities, with 38,000 megawatts of generating capacity, serving more than 5 million customers in 11 states. Uh, Bob has deep expertise not only in f uh, fossil fuel generation, but, it, but a deep background in, the, in uh, nuclear generation as well. Uh, as we were talking behind, backstage, these two guys also uh, share a hobby in, in uh, they're both guitar players and they were comparing strat notes back there. So maybe if, if things get really boring, we'll, we'll get you to play. Um, I want to start, uh, this session is going to talk about security, particularly security in the grid, security uh, in the American context. Uh, Dan, I'm going to make you talk a little bit about security in the global context as okay. well, if that's okay. But let's start with cyber security. Yeah. Um, Fairly recently, on the front page of all the uh, newspapers in the country, this report by Mandiant about the deep penetration of, of the Chinese uh, hackers into American corporate life, uh, uh, you know, played out. Uh, there was a reaction by the Chinese. Uh, let's start with the business threat. How big of a business threat do you think uh, hacking is now, and particularly this uh, threat from foreign powers? Uh, John, I think that the hacking threat uh, is already much larger than is widely perceived, uh, and I think it's getting worse, and I think it has a number of uh, very chilling and worrisome dimensions. I just mentioned three, uh, just to get us uh, started in, in talking about it. Moving up from an adversary perspective, the value chain, for a long time, and people out here know this, uh, people have been breaking into our networks. Anyone who's read uh, Dick Clark's book on cyber wars knows how many points of vulnerability we have in our networks and has been exfiltrating large amounts of data. Uh, the intellectual property theft implications of this, uh, industrial e espionage implications of this, uh, financial and other implications of this are, are extraordinary. Uh, we have also witnessed uh, as you move beyond mere exfiltration of uh, data through these massive botnets that have expanded out there, uh, increasingly wide-scale, multifaceted, de uh, distributed denial of service attacks. So it's one thing, first they steal your data, then you, they stop you from operating. Uh, again, anyone who picked up uh, the newspapers a couple, a uh, few months ago saw a certain uh, energy company with 30,000 computers turn into bricks overnight. Uh, and uh, and uh, that actually segues into the third thing, which is now uh, moving out of uh, just blocking service, but then actually taking at times kinetic actions that can have tremendously uh, damaging, uh, costly, and, and even life-threatening implications. So I would say, in short, the threat that we, we face is a, a very serious one and a growing one. And before we get to the solution, I'll just, uh, as a preview of coming attractions, note that uh, with Nick Akins and Bob and many of his colleagues in the industry, there's been a very robust and I'd say deepening dialogue uh, 
uh, between government and industry that's actually taking a very hard look at these threats to think what we can do working together to help start to address them. Bob, uh, let, me, let me turn to you. And before we get to the security side of this and, and the threat to the network itself, how, how real is this as a business threat for, for your company? What, what's your, what have you been experience, experiencing? I think there, we've reached the reality where uh, someone's knocking at your door every day. Mm -hmm. And you've got to act as if that's the case and uh, have the appropriate detection and response to keep them at the door and not inside the door. So that's the way we act. We have a specific cybersecurity center on our networks to uh, act in response to that threat, and um, we want to keep the grid safe. Well, uh, I, I, I sometimes joke that I run a think tank, and that happens to me every day. Uh, but I I'd say it would cost us a lot less because since we publish all of our material, if they just wait a day, they'll see it the yeah. next day. But that's not true for you. Talk about the security implications of this uh, for the network. And well, there's the business proprietary information intellectual property issue right. but also as our grid becomes more and more digital there's the need to make sure that um, the folks that are knocking at the door don't gain access to SCADA equipment or digitally controlled distribution equipment so there's both hardware and intellectual property issues that uh, you need to be concerned about and protect uh, the consumers and um, your, your customers uh, against. Dan mentioned there's a greater level of uh, cooperation now. Talk about that from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. The industry and uh, the government, uh, I think in part from the breakthroughs of cooperation that we've seen in response to Hurricane Sandy, have begun a dialogue regarding um, a, a variety of threats, including cyber, including physical um, threats to the grid, whether they be weather-related or, uh, or terrorist-related. So uh, quite a bit of dialogue. We met in Washington uh, just about a month ago to uh, establish the framework for that working relationship. We're signing senior executives in the industry to work with counterparts in government to talk about things like uh, security access so we can have a language of communication regarding the threat, to talk about technologies that might be useful at the front end to detect and deter tre threats, uh, and then also talk about situational awareness. What are we going to do to uh, tabletop and exercise um, both weather-related threats, cyber threats, physical security threats, so that there's a common language, a common experience between uh, industry and government? It's pretty good stuff. <laughs> uh, Dan, last fall, the uh, one of the administration's priorities was to pass a cybersecurity bill. Uh, that met with some business resistance, uh, and, there, and, and it, was, it was blocked as it, w it went along. Um, what's changed, if anything? I think, John, I, I think we've had actually a very healthy evolution. Uh, and I talked to a number of our colleagues in industry uh, actually since uh, that episode. And a lot of work in our sector has already gone into the development of standards. You know, NERC. Uh, got the responsibility uh, for this mission back in 2006 and has had extensive uh, discussions in developing the standards and enforcing the standards with industry. Folks in industry had a concern, hey look, we've already invested a lot of effort here, let's not come up with a lot of new standards. We heard that and I think that what you've seen since when the President came out on the day of the State of the Union with his uh, cybersecurity executive order is frankly an acknowledgement of how far that dialogue has has uh, advanced because what was that time? I was talking about exchange of information, making sure that, and we were talking about this backstage as well, that we get real time information that we may have uh, that is relevant to the private sector to them. Talking about things that, that uh, we can do to help work together because after all the vast majority of the assets that are at risk are in the private sector to take those particular advantages that each of us have and make them available to the, to the other party. So I think the executive order captures about as much as we can do in that collaborative sense and of course there are still other things left out there to do. So for example if industry uh, wishes to do things that will actually have some uh, effect to mitigate a cyber attack or, uh, or a cyber threat they would benefit from having some clear rules, safe harbors against liability if they are doing something that is well-intentioned and, and well-conceived but doesn't go right because that's the nature of, of reality. So I think that uh, the, the executive order captures the level of dialogue that we achieved, frankly, some of it on the back of the uh, sometimes tough conversation about the legislation, but I think it puts us in a place where we can actually get some important things done now, but I think it preserves the option to still, if we can get there, get legislation. So still, there's still a need to 
try to push forward with some legislative. There are theory. still things, for example, in terms of liability protections, in terms of uh, how we regulate our own federal uh, activities, in terms of uh, uh, legal enforcement mechanisms. Uh, uh, of course, as you well know from your time in the White House, an executive order cannot create a new authority, so it's based on existing statutory authorities. Right. So there are a few places where, yes, it would be helpful to push out the envelope. What's, what's your sense of, you, I know you're, you're dealing with the, with the power industry and the energy industry, but what about the other critical infrastructure yeah. systems? Do you see the same level of uh, engagement with, with the national government now? Or I have. Do I you have. think the yeah. power industry is out in front? Well, I would say a couple of things. The power industry, I would say, is very focused. Uh, but, of course, uh, and I think Bob already referred to SCADA's, the perfect storm that is, is happening is as the cyber threat has advanced to a more sophisticated and therefore pernicious phase, at that moment we are like opening more and more flanks of exposed vulnerabilities as we get smarter and smarter and digitize the control systems, not just over the electrical grid, right. but certainly over gas pipelines and others. So I would tell you in the interagency meetings that you used to uh, chair that you will not find anybody from any agency who is not keenly aware, and of course, the financial sector has been under a sustained assault. So I would say everybody is moving in the same direction. I think because of the unique vulnerabilities, because of the searing experience, first in 1965, but more pertinent in 2003, I think the power sector did uh, get something of a head start. Bob, there's a conventional wisdom is that, that uh, notwithstanding that constant level of attack, that the corporate community has been unwilling, really, to talk about this publicly for fear of, 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 uh, uh, of reputational risk or, or whatever. Do you think that's changed? First of all, do you think it was true? And second, has it changed? Or you read the paper this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I don't know whether there's a, you know, a, a, a difference in perspective of disclosure from a corporate standpoint. I, I think what I see in the utility industry is you know, just basically an acceptance of the reality that the threat is there, that we need to be responsive and responsible to the threat and to act accordingly. Um. Uh, Bob raised the question of uh, exercise and exercising together. What's the, what's the status of, of that, Dan, both inside the government and with the private sector? Uh, it's a great question, and I, in full confession mode, have to say, I came to this issue as something of a skeptic. I, I was one of these people who said, I can't exercise, I have work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we actually had last year uh, sustained over a number of meetings uh, that extended I think into a few months, a national level exercise that, that looked at the real life consequences of a possible cyber security uh, threat. And when it came to uh, my level, to the so-called deputies committee where we we're sitting around in the White House. To be honest, it was to me astonishing how little we knew about who had what roles and missions, just to begin there. The other thing that struck me right off the bat is we're talking literally about a threat that propagates with the speed of light as, as viruses course around the internet and our response in government to anything as we call a meeting. So this thing has gone to 58,000 more machines by the time you even get the notice out and God knows what happens before you meet. So it shows that uh, the, uh, and, and by the way, this ended up with a, a, a national level exercise chaired by the president where a lot of these things became clear. And so the takeaway out of that exercise, John, was that we actually need to do a lot more exercising and that we could not allow the real deal to be what a lawyer would call a case of first impression. And that we had to therefore, and, and the issues are very uh, tricky because sometimes you are uh, not willing simply to be a, a passive defender we used to talk about the M&M &M, uh, approach to security, you guard the outside, but once somebody breaks through the perimeter, it's all soft on the inside, that's no good. So you gotta go to a resiliency model, and how are you going to respond in real time with potentially pretty aggressive counter actions? That means you have to think through what kind of delegations of authority you wanna put in place. That means you gotta think about how you can increase automation of the response, and then that's just the federal government. We just a few weeks ago in the meeting Bob was referring to, got together between the government and the White House and the Department of Homeland Security and uh, the major trade associations, the Edison Electric Institute, the Rural uh, Cooperatives and RECA, the American uh, Public Power Association and the Nuclear Energy Institute. And we agreed we need to do now joint exercises and we're uh, in the process of beginning to plan one.
Bob, what's your, uh, what, what's your reaction to the status of where the, that dialogue is? Yeah, I think it's uh, the, within the I utility. The, and by industry, the, way, the, the, the industry's been doing this for yeah, a while, Yeah, the, right? the nuke and me is going to come out and say, um, those exercises, in fact, establish your uh, command response, your communication channels, and leads to effective response to uh, a real event. But, you know, within the industry, there are, you know, drills that are done either by mandates in states. Hurricane-prone states have right. a requirement to drill. Other states just do it as a matter of good practice. But we're at the the planning stage to, since Sandy really demonstrated the fact that some of our weather events are having very, very broad regional um, effect, that we need to make sure we've got the communication channels to handle an incident like that. Uh, uh, Dan, you, you, you said the president chaired, that not, not some acting sit-in president, right? The president chaired the national Barack election. Barack Obama. Exercise. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but to, to just riff we off... We asked him what his takeaway was. What would yeah. it be? <laughs> uh, that we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. I think it would be. <laughs> but uh, to, to go to Bob's point, I think this is a really interesting combination where it turns out, and you're, you're, you're going to see, I think, uh, John, more and more of this, that a number of the things that we realized were stripped bare in terms of our vulnerabilities and the fragility of our aging grid, you know, when, when, you, when you look from industry to industry between cars and computers and, and the one thing that hasn't changed since the 1930s are the poles with the cans on yep. top, right? Uh, and uh, the, the president also played a daily leadership role in the response to Hurricane Sandy, and I think many of us drew from that searing experience the conclusion that we just really have to double down because a lot of the same investments that we're making to be more resilient against the natural threats uh, of storms uh, and so forth will also make us more robust against cyber threats. Uh, I, I want to get to resilience, but I want to ask you one more question because you raised the Saudi Aramco attack, uh, which at least intelligence source, anonymous intelligence sources, uh, pinned on the Iranians, U.S. intelligence sources. Uh, we're now in uh, what looks like might be something of an end game, might be a long end game, with uh, renewed uh, conversations with the Iranians on their nuclear program. Uh, how big of a threat does, do, do you assess uh, the uh, c capacity of, uh, we, we, we thought a lot about China, what about the, what about the Iranian threat uh, in the context yeah. of a... I would just put it this way, uh, John, I, I think uh, and again, uh, I recommend people take a look at Dick Clark's book. There are certain uh, adversaries who uh, have a big head start and who are uh, head and shoulders uh, above others in terms of their capacity to inflict harm. Uh, that having been said, uh, there's, there's a lot of capability and that capability is growing. Uh, and uh, even as our vulnerabilities are growing, and let's just say that a country like Iran has motive and opportunity. So I would characterize it, I don't think there's a, a, an integer I could apply to it, but I would characterize it as a serious and growing threat. You've been deeply involved in both establishing the sanctions regime through direct diplomacy, uh, and, uh, and, and as I noted, you're an expert on arms control. How do you, how do you uh, see the effect on energy markets uh, as a result of this kind of tumbling forward through the course of the spring and summer? Well, to keep it uh, focused on, on this topic, I'm going to break this uh, answer into two, two pieces. Number one, uh, we, and when I say we, I mean the United States in cooperation with all the producing nations and all the uh, declining number of nations that are consuming oil from Iran are going to have to keep working very, very hard to make sure that markets remain well supplied. And the nice uh, segue uh, from that to the other is, uh, in a case like the situation with Iran, where they will have to, to uh, get, I suppose, the level of response they want, uh, go asymmetric. They're not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe necessarily with us in the Straits of Hormuz, but I think you've just seen some indicators of what can happen. So I think we're going to have to, in short, uh, John, have a parallel effort that even as we have our conventional sanctions diplomacy that's trying to keep markets calm, keep markets well supplied so that the price stays down and we can contain uh, and continue our, our economic recovery, we're going to have to have a parallel structure of not just diplomacy but actual responses to both A, provide the protection and the, uh, against the, the threat and B, coordinate on the response because obviously uh, a threat like this does not have any respect for international boundaries. Right. 
Thanks for the clarity of that answer, by the way. <laughs> Bob, let's, let's, let's shift to uh, disaster recovery, the experience with, uh, you know, particularly with, with uh, Hurricane Sandy, but you, you experienced this uh, month to month, I suspect, throughout your service area. Uh, uh, Dan raised the strategies on, uh, on the security side as being pretty much the same with respect to resilience from the threats of, uh, of storm damage or other you know, physical threats to the grid. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, you're going to both have to look at uh, scenarios to harden the grid physically, but also look at the resources you have to respond. And quite frankly, on the spectrum of things, to have an absolutely hardened grid is probably infinitely difficult and infinitely expensive. You're going to find some sweet spot in the middle where you've reasonably hardened the grid, but you're still going to have to deploy resources to uh, to affect repair when you have a major major storm. So that's what the industry's doing in response to Sandy, taking a look at what went well, what didn't go so well, make sure we can mobilize as many resources as possible, but also take a look at lessons learned and what are the uh, best practices, so to speak, for hardening the grid. So. What, uh, in terms of the resilience of the grid, uh, is there uh, it, it, does this continue the argument for more distribution of generation? Uh, I, I think it could. I think there's some practical realities. I mean, we've done quite a bit to integrate battery technology um, into the grid. Um, even in our largest scale, our batteries are meg megawatt class size, but you're talking about seven hour capacity. At a smaller scale, we've got two or three hours of lithium ion capacity and a community ed energy storage type application, but you're talking about two or three hours of response. So on the battery side, we're looking for the breakthroughs that um, these sort of forums are trying to uh, attain to see a, a greater improvement. If you want something that's going to last, because again, we're going to have this balance between something that's not infinitely resilient but reasonably resilient, you're going to need some sources of distributed power that uh, either have a fuel supply, natural gas, or diesel, or solar, and uh, you're going to have to have battery backup to deal with the intermittency. So I think. It's possible to imagine that scenario, but I think in terms of deployment, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a while out there, and we're going to need some breakthroughs in terms of some fundamental capacity. Dan, what do you think? Well, I think it's a very interesting point, and to me, it brings sort of the third leg of the stool uh, together, because our, we've already talked about the cyber threats. We've already talked uh, we're not about the storm resiliency, and the very things you just heard Bob talking about in terms of uh, batteries to address the issue of intermittency. Uh, John, the premise of your question in terms of distributed power, all of this feeds also into our broader uh, thematic uh, effort for overall grid modernization for all of the reasons that you heard Secretary Chu speak just a few minutes ago. Uh, a 21st century grid to support a 21st century energy sector that uh, is much more efficient, that uh, reduces the gap between the peak and the base load, uh, that uh, shifts the priorities from uh, focusing just on added power uh, generation to demand side management, but beginning with a much greater sensory awareness of what's going on the grid. We've all read the stories about you know, the tree that fell on the line that started the whole uh, concatenation of events that led to the 2003 blackout. That was, that was a tree on one of your lines. Was no, that one of your lines? No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's just be clear. The 765 KV transmission system of AEP stopped it from going across it's the It's a little sensitive. It's a little sensitive about <laughs> no. that. But in any event, but, but what it goes to is a lot of these things that you're going to want to do to be really smart about integrating inter intermittent power generation sources. You take a place, and we're using it, frankly, as a laboratory, like the Bonneville Power Administration, where you've got this very steep watershed, and the water is either rushing down or it's not there at all, and then the wind dies, you know, dies down or blows up, and you get people who get very cranky about how the payment streams flow with respect to when things are on and off. And a lot of the things that we're doing that will provide much faster turnaround times for resiliency in response to either a cyber threat or a natural disaster will also help both in terms of load management and integration uh, of, of all of the smart grid technologies that are so important to the overall modernization and transformation of our energy economy. So I won't be a smart aleck anymore, Bob. That was first energy, by the way, <laughs> smart aleck. <Alec. laughs> <laughs> Rippled into your yes. material. What, but we uh, digress. <laughs> what, um, what, in, in, in terms of the complication in the strategy with respect to that, how does uh, resiliency and particularly building more uh, uh, grid level uh, renewable power affect the calculus that, that Dan was just 
talking about? Yeah, um, well, the calculus is very interesting because as smart as you might get the grid, if you don't do some of the hardening we've talked about, you know, a million plus digital devices that all say the power's out and meanwhile the poles are down and the wires are down, right. you got a problem. So I think the balance here we're going to have to strike is there is some neat things that technology can do in terms of situational awareness, some neat things technology can do in terms of self-healing circuitry. Um, but again, for the major casualty, I think you're going to have to look at this combination of deployment of digital technology, which will help with situational awareness, but you're just going to have to get into the nuts and bolts and the hard work of physically hardening the grid, whether it be stronger poles, whether it be stronger wire, whether it be undergrounding, whether it be distributed sources of generation that can help um, mitigate circumstance for some period of time. But it's just going to be that combination of hard work. For, for the crowd at the ARPA E uh, conference, if you uh, look at innovation on the technology side, where do you see the need? What do you, what, where do you, where you want to create a demand pull? Well, I think this is a nexus for both general energy issues and um, this sort of grid hardening issue that we're mm -hmm. talking about. But storage, storage, storage would be a great place to see some breakthroughs in terms of, uh, uh, of, of helping uh, both the integration of renewable and intermittent resources into the system, distributed resources, and dealing with some of the intermittency issues on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the grid itself due to calamity of, of either weather-related or uh, other physical issues on the grid. Storage is a, is a big deal. Dan? I, I would just uh, I agree with that part uh, in, in terms of the specific concern about security. I still think we've got a lot of headroom in technology space just to respond to the specific kind of cyber threats. Uh, we have uh, we, we deployed uh, an enhanced cybersecurity package uh, at the Department of Energy sites, now extending to the uh, Power Marketing Administrations after three of our labs were attacked, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Thomas Jefferson, and Pacific uh, Northwest uh, Laboratory. But we have found, even recently, you probably uh, have seen we had other problems with our uh, cyber attacks, uh, that our technical tools are not yet up to snuff to defeat the increasingly sophisticated first day cyber threat. So, but I certainly subscribe to the uh, uh, storage uh, requirement that uh, Bob talked about as well. Bob, you, the AP just entered into a settlement just the last couple of days mm -hmm. with uh, EPA and a series of Northeast states to shut down some coal fire power and made a commitment, I think, to build some uh, both solar and, and, and wind power. Uh, earlier in the, in the morning, we had a discussion about the effect of the low price of natural gas and the abundance of particularly uh, the gas from the sh uh, shale plays. Uh, How is that affecting the companies thinking about uh, particularly introducing more renewables into your uh, generation system? Well, I think the low price of natural gas is both a, a blessing, as we heard in the discussion this morning, and if you're a fan of other technologies per se, um, it does have um, the consequence of putting price pressure on those alternatives. So absent public policy that suggests some of those alternatives should be encouraged, whether it be renewables, whether it be coal, whether it be nuclear, you're basically either the, the market, if there's a competitive market, it basically is it wants one thing. It wants the most efficient, lowest cost source of generation. It doesn't care about public policy. Even if in, your, in a regulated circumstance, you basically have an obligation to provide the least cost option. So with those circumstances, either in a competitive market or a regulated circumstance, if natural gas is as low as it is, and the capital cost of a combined cycle plant, as an example, is a seventh the price of a nuclear plant, you're going to see a lot of capital migrate towards natural gas for those market or regulated sort of reasons. We only have a, a minute left, but uh, you made a major investment in West Virginia in what could have was the, had the potential right. for Mountaineer, uh, Mountaineer right. the yeah. uh, large-scale uh, carbon capture and right. sequestration project. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if I understand things right, that the, at least the CCS side of that is kind of mothballed for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh, do either one of you see any future for CCS without a more dramatic intervention well, uh, at the public policy level? I, I think, again, going back to my, still going on, yeah. but. to my last answer, I mean, the, the low price of natural gas is sending a price signal that would direct you otherwise. The fact that there isn't a price for carbon is sending you another signaling, not to make AEP out like a superhero, but 
we did that, and we ended up eating a lot of the money associated with that um, demonstration for carbon capture, storage, and sequestration. So, oh, and, and the reasons the state said we weren't going to pay for it is no law, no price for carbon, no requirement. So all those things kind of come together to say something's going to have to happen a little bit different in circumstance right now to make CCS real. Yeah. We have 30 seconds. I'll, I'll be very quick. Number one, in the uh, presence of low natural gas prices and the absence of a price on carbon, public policy is going to continue to be very, very important to the viability of, of this, point one. Point two, the one place where we have found that we can start to make the business case close is those places where you can combine that with something like enhanced oil recovery, where you can add the U, the utilization to the CCS equation, and that at least begins to close the business case. And the third thing is, in partnership with other countries that are also dedicated for their own reasons, either in uh, places like through Mazda or India and China that have their own needs for their own purposes, there may be other sources of investment that can help defray and uh, level out the investment that we would otherwise need to make. But even there, you're talking about some kind of combination of leveraging other countries' resources uh, into our public policies, because countries like India, China, United States, parts of Central Europe, Poland, we're going to continue burning a lot of coal, and it's in all of our interest to burn it clean. So you haven't given up on it? Have not given up on okay. it. Okay. Thank you, guys. It was right. a terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much.